We are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our focus online lecture one four three and the glaucoma session forty seven. And this is a special session by our special speaker, that is Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, sir. And he will be talking on is it the nerve or the pressure? And he will be covering creating the gray zone between the glaucoma and neuroophthal overlays. It's an interactive session. And I would request Vanita ma'am to please introduce Rashmin sir, who needs no introduction, as you will say. Good. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Rolika. Uh, you know, our uh, audience is very well versed with who Dr. Rashmin Gandhi is, our very own uh, in house neuro ophthalmologist, well known throughout uh, the country. with uh, with everybody. He, uh, I think everyone now knows that he has been, uh, a, you know, a pillar at Shankar Netrale, but since he left uh, Chennai, he came up, came to Hyderabad and joined Center for Sight. Uh, he's still associated with Center for Sight Hyderabad, um, uh, but ha is now a director at uh, Foresight uh, Worldwide, a uh, part maybe not many people know about him, is he, um, he provides skill, technical or otherwise expertise related to ophthalmology setup worldwide, especially in uh, needy countries in Africa. Very worthwhile uh, initiative, I have to say. So uh, with those words, uh, interrupting the international masterclass, we have our own master delivering an interactive talk on whether it's the nerve or whether it's the pressure. Rashmi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vanita, for that uh, wonderful introduction. and. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of iFocus. We have been part of it uh, since six years and it's always nice to be here. Now, uh, as uh, the audience who are watching online and uh, people here at HotSip, you know that this is going to be an interactive lecture. Uh, this is a lecture which I'm filling in for because uh, 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 the person who was supposed to deliver the lecture today, uh, unfortunately could not join online today. So let's get going and see as to what are the scenarios which would prompt you to think, are you really dealing with glaucoma? You are right now, obviously this is a glaucoma module. So I'm taking a different approach. I'm taking a different view and say that, when would you say that, oh, this doesn't smell or sound like glaucoma? And we will deal with this with a few examples. And I would request uh, Dr. Sony and Dr. Prithvi to interact because it's going to be all uh, interactive. So let's talk about the first case. This is a, this is a hypothetical case uh, for 46 year old male with gradual loss of vision in both the eyes. Uh, he was diagnosed as having primary open angle glaucoma elsewhere. Uh, just to add a spice, I've said that, okay, he has undergone trap elsewhere. And you would see these patients in your, uh, in your clinical practice as well, that patient would have been diagnosed as in glaucoma, probably would have been treated even aggressively like the trabeculectomy. Uh, her, his visual acuity is 612 in the right eye and 69 in the left eye. And Dr. Pressures are borderline 22 in both the eyes and the angles are open. Now, only with just this information, is there any red flag? Uh, either one of you, Dr. Sony or Dr. Prithvi, if both of you are not answering, then I would go to Christy or Ronika. Is there any red flag? Are we dealing with uh, patients who uh, have been told that they have glaucoma, but we are trying to look at the other aspect and say, maybe it is not glaucoma, is it something else? So can you think of any red flag just by the information that has been provided here, which is telling you that, oh, let me look at this a little more carefully because this uh, doesn't sound, or there is something which I'm not comfortable with uh, telling this guy that he has glaucoma. 46 year old male with this history, visual acuity being 612, 69, intractor pressures to be borderline, and uh, elsewhere diagnosis in POAG. Yes, Dr. Sony, are you here with us? Sir, good evening, sir. Hi, good evening. Uh, sir, uh, the angles are open, and uh, in spite of uh, post trap, the pressures are borderline. Okay. Uh, 
so that can happen in glaucoma, right? If if your trabeculectomy is not filtering well, you would still have uh, a pressure which has uh, gone up. So that's that. See, uh, what is the the premise? So what's the main focus of this talk? Is that what are the red flags that you look at to say that oh, this is not glaucoma. There's something else going on here, and that's what you need to think of. So is there any red flag in this history? Prithvi, do you want to try as well? <coughs> Don't make a mistake. It's 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 uh, it's not an exam here. It's better to make a mistake here. Okay, so let me tell you. Uh, you were right, otherwise, Doctor Swami, that uh, why the pressure is well, and that's uh, pretty too, and that's something which which should alert you as well. But you need to uh, remember that a young person who has been told that he has a primary disease. Now that's something which which does not happen too often. And uh, just to quote this uh, this pressure, uh, this paper by Greenfield, a little old pressure a paper. It said that age under the age of a person with the age under 50, you should be looking at features of non glaucomatous event, unless you are very sure if the patient was on steroids, patient had uveitis, uh, or anything that can explain that why he should be having glaucoma. Primary disease uh, in somebody under the age of 50, you should be alert and say that uh, look for all the features. It's not that glaucoma cannot. Uh, present under the age of 50, but if somebody under the age of 50 and you're saying it's a primary disease, look at the clinical picture even more carefully. So that's uh, the optic disc that the patient had. Now we are looking at second patient. So the first red flag is anybody below the age of 50, uh, primary disease, look at uh, the patient carefully. Scenario number two, this is of a 56 year old female who is complaining of gradual loss of vision in both. Ravi Rashman, can I just interrupt? Would yeah, sure. uh, I would also consider a young patient, of course, you've not given us the visual field, but the vision does not uh, correlate very well. 6, 9, 6, 12. Correct. Yeah, I'm, uh, absolutely. So then the vision is, is something which, which I'm, I'm developing. So that was the second point which I was coming to, that Thank a 56 you. year old female with a gradual loss of vision in both the eyes, visual activity being 2 by 60 and 6 by 36, Intraocular pressures being 18 millimeters of mercury and open angles. Now, with this information, any red flag? Uh, Dr. Praveen, Dr. Prithvi, Dr. Soni. What we are talking about here, we are talking about is it really glaucoma or something else is going on? So, you need to look at from the other point of view. Uh, Dr. Soni or Dr. Prithvi, any one of you? What do you think? Uh, Dr. Vanita already mentioned about. This is that profound visual impairment or a visual impairment early in the disease. That's not something which is quite common in glaucoma. Uh, Jonathan Trobe uh, et al. found that 20 patients with compressive optic neuropathy had loss of central vision, which, is, which happens fairly early in the disease process versus glaucoma, where the central vision is preserved till the late uh, progression of the disease. Greenfield et al. found visual activity to be less than 20 by 40 to be specific, 77% 70, specific for non glaucomatous cupping. So these patients can have cupping, but if the visual equity is, is lower, and as Dr. Anita mentioned, early in the disease, you your, your antenna is up saying, is it really glaucoma or you're dealing with something else? Hup et al. described pairing of central equity in six eyes with compressive lesion. So it sometimes can happen that patient can still be having compressive lesion and central equity can be spared, but we're talking about other way around, the patient who has been diagnosed as a glaucoma and you are debating what are the red flags that you look at to say that, yes, this is not glaucoma. So first we said uh, younger patient. Now, second point is about visual activity. Somebody who has a profound visual impairment, that's something which is not very common, especially early in the disease process in, uh, in glaucoma. So that's uh, point number two. We're now going to third case. And these are all the instances which we are just developing. It's a developing story to say that one by one, as we see patient, we first look at the age, now we look at the visual activity. So let's see what is in store for us in this patient. This is a 70-year-old male with profound loss of vision in both the eyes. Vision is 6-9 in the right eye, 1 by 16 in the left eye. That's again, you are looking at this and say, oh, why the patient has 1 by 60 vision? 
intraocular pressures are uh, pulling you towards glaucoma saying, oh, pressures are a little high, uh, but uh, the optic discs are looking like this. And uh, I, to be helpful here, I have put a white arrow and that's the feature that I want you to look at. I want you to look at and then tell me what is the red flag here. First red flag was age. Second red flag was visual impairment. We're looking at the third red flag here. Dr. Sony, what do you see here? The temporal pallor. Excellent. Excellent. What I wanted to highlight here is that though this patient had a 21 pressure, though the cup is a little larger, but what you are need to look at is the neuroretinal rim. And you, as uh, Dr. Sony, you mentioned very nicely that the neuroretinal rim is pale here. And that's something which is a very big red flag. Uh, let's see what Harry Quigley and his group from Baltimore uh, told us about cupping of the optic disc in ischemic cup neuropathy. He found that 50% of the patients with arthritic AI and developed cupping compared to uh, non-arthritic AI. So uh, temporal arthritis causing arthritic AI, and these are the patients who go into infarct in an acute phase. So the arthritic AI causes uh, acute, profound loss of vision in the affected eye. And the clinical picture, you will find what is described as pallid dyskinema. So there is a dyskinema, but the ischemia is of such a severe degree that in the acute phase itself, these patients start developing pallor. So please use the term pallid dyskinema only when you find the patient has a dyskinema and simultaneous optic disc pallor. Typically, pallid dyskinema is reserved to describe the disc appearance in arthritic AI. Arthritic AON, as you know, is one of the types of AION. The other types can be non-arthritic or PION. Arthritic AION typically occurs because of some vascular pathology. The most common uh, vascular pathology uh, that patient may be uh, suffering from is temporal arthritis. So temporal arthritis, uh, arthritic AION, these patients can develop cupping early in the disease. And uh, they would have, though they would have cupping, they will have pale neuroretinal rim. So the third point that you need to look at is appearance of the disc. And in the appearance of the disc, even if there is a presence of cupping, but if the neurotonal rim is pale, you know that you're probably looking at a neurological disease. Now, what is the next step? You found that the neurotonal rim is pale. Uh, how would you confirm what would you do next? Prithvi, are you here? Have you joined us? Then this might be your question. If not, then we'll go back to our only hot sitter, Dr. Sony. Dr. Sony, what would you do next? The visual fields. Okay, nice, nice visual fields. But before that, anything that might give you a clue that, yeah, what you're thinking is, is right. And this patient has an optic nerve disease, which is non-glaucomatous disease. Remember, glaucoma, according to the current disease uh, definition, is a form of optic neuropathy. It's just that what causes that optic neuropathy is different from the other optic neuropathies. The risk factor for developing that optic neuropathy is different in glaucoma, while the other neurological disease causing optic neuropathy, the risk factors are different. So visual field is an important uh, uh, component, uh, which is uh, in your armamentarium for the management of glaucoma, but anything else that you do here? Sir, uh, systemic, systemically, we, uh, we should evaluate the patient. Before that, before that, very good, excellent. Yes, we need to evaluate the patient systemically, but before that, uh, anything else? Color vision. Yes, before color vision, excellent. Macular function test. And before that, <laughs> very nice. Just one thing is remaining now. You made my job easy because the rest of the slides will, will go like a breeze, but one more thing. What is the most important optic nerve function test? Only objective optic nerve function test clinically. Pupillary reaction. Fantastic. Fantastic. So the next step, you need to see if, if you find that you're not very convinced about the neurotonal rim. You feel that, oh, this neurotonal rim looks like pale and uh, I'm not convinced whether this is glaucoma or whether this is some other form of optic neuropathy. The next thing you look at is perform swinging flashlight test to see whether the patient has RAPD. Now how this fits into our, our patient scenario, you need to remember, and this paper I'm uh, quoting from Brown et al, very nicely done work again, long ago, but still very relevant. What they found, they found that 
so the question really is that if you find RAPD, would you label all those patients as non-glaucomatous because RAPD is a sign of an optic neuropathy, which is asymmetrical? Or do you have some kind of framework which will guide you to say that even if you found RAPD, uh, it can still be glaucoma. So what they found, they found that if you have a difference between the cup, between two eyes more than 0 0.43, 0 0.4, then those patients can actually exhibit RAPD even if the patient had glaucoma. Because what it tells you is that the loss of neuron, neuronal loss between two eyes is asymmetrical and significantly more in one eye uh, than the other eye, even if it's because of glaucoma. And those patients can exhibit glaucoma, you know, can exhibit RAPD. So if there is a difference of cupping of more than 0.4, uh, then you say, okay, even if I found RAPD, but if it's if it uh, sounds like glaucoma, then it can still be glaucoma. But if you found RAPD uh, for somebody who has a cupping a difference, difference of cupping of only 0.2, uh, and you found RAPD in one eye, then you know that clinically, the difference in the neuronal loss is not so high. And RAPD then indicates that patient probably is having a loss of his neurons because of some other disease process and not glaucoma. So we looked at age, we looked at visual equity, we looked at appearance of optic disc. The third thing, the other thing is look at the pupil. In all patients that we, that comes to you, obviously you're supposed to check pupil reaction. And if you found RAPD with a cup difference, which is not significant, you know that you are dealing with optic neuropathy of some other cause. The other thing, as you very rightly said, uh, Dr. Sony, is color vision. Why, why would you look at color vision, Dr. Sony? Uh, Dr. Prithvi, I know that you are uh, uh, you're working with us here at Center for Side, but you are you're free to answer if you want to. And same goes with uh, Christy or Rolika. But first chance is Dr. to Dr. Sony. Why why do you think color vision is important to differentiate uh, the patients uh, who have optic neuropathy to differentiate a glaucomatous optic neuropathy versus a non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy? And I've given you answer or hint to the answer. In the second point, which is highlighted here on this slide. So, Dr. Sony, the question is why color vision is important. No, sir. No, the, the, the hint is there. Look at the next point. Papillomacular bundle. Yeah, versus? Arcuate fibers. So, which fibers are affected first in glaucoma, generally speaking? Between the two. Arcuate fibers. Excellent. Arcuate fibers, which, which generally start from temporal to macula, they make an arch. That's why they call arcuate superiorly and inferiorly. And they get attached to the superior and inferior pole of the disc. So yeah. uh, they don't serve the color vision. Yes. And that's the reason why color vision is preserved in patients with glaucoma till late. Color vision gets affected in pathology early in the disease, which primarily affect papillomacular bundle. The, the, Fibers which start from macula and go and attach directly to the edge of the optic disc or the surface of the optic disc. And they get affected in, in conditions like nutritional optic neuropathy, LHON, toxic optic neuropathy. These fibers get affected first. Practically, almost all optic neuropathy, even optic neuritis, would have an impact on this first. And that's the reason why color vision gets affected. Patients would have dyschromatopsia early in the disease process in a non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. But in a glaucomatous optic neuropathy, because they are primarily uh, affecting arcuate fibers, which are temporal to macula, not cause, they are not affected, uh, 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 they are not serving color vision. So that's the reason why color vision is preserved uh, till a little late in the disease. And that also explains why you have superior and by vertical elongation of cup, why there is a notching superiorly and inferiorly, because these are the fibers which are affected. That also explains why most patients will have a nasal step as their first visual defect in glaucoma. So remember, arcuate fibers are the fibers which are affected in glaucoma, while papillomacular bundle are the fibers which are affected in non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Clinically, you would differentiate between the two by uh, doing a simple test. If patient has dyschromatopsia, you know that you are dealing, especially early in the disease, you know you are dealing with non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. So what are the non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy apart from we looked at ischemic optic neuropathy, especially arthritic variety uh, uh, just in a few slides earlier. The other uh, 
the most important optic nerve process that you're worried about uh, and which you should not be missing out on would be compressive optic nerve process. That the tumor which is sitting somewhere, pressing on the optic nerve, uh, probably causing uh, cupping in few patients. And that's what this Mark Cooper Smith's paper tells us. The 250 patients with compressive lesion, actually 16 had cupping when they presented. And five of these patients out of 250 actually were diagnosed, were labeled as glaucoma initially. Uh, and then later on, because they did not behave as they should have uh, as a glaucomatous optic neuropathy, the diagnosis was then uh, uh, shifted to compressive lesion. So what could have been missed out or what you would look at is appearance of the optic now apart from the, uh, the pupil and color vision and pale neurotal rim is more, much more common in compressive optic neuropathy by bearing of circumlinear vessels or temporal saucerization is much more common in glaucoma. Please remember though that some of these vessel signs can also be seen in compressive lesion. So what it tells you is that even if the patient has cupping, maybe if, even if the signs look like glaucoma, look at neurotal rim very carefully, look at pupils carefully, look at color vision carefully. So glaucoma versus compression, can uh, clinical features give you a clue whether you are dealing with glaucoma or compression? Well, this is what uh, we, we, uh, we conclude, that pallor is 90% specific for compressive optic neuropathy, while the other features are the specificity given. If patient has an optic disc hemorrhage, and in this study they said that 100% specificity for glaucoma. Family history of glaucoma, 96%, you know that you probably are dealing with glaucoma. No fiber bundle, loss of vertical rim, the sensitivities are given here. So uh, sometimes the allied features will give you a clue if you're not very sure whether you're dealing with glaucoma or compressive lesion. Now, what are, uh, uh, what are the uh, causes of optic disc cupping, which is not because of glaucoma? We, we said that you would find it in uh, AION and PION. Uh, apart from that, you can uh, occasionally see uh, cupping even in patients who have optic neuritis because of demyelination. LHON or optic disc uh, atrophy, autosomal dominant optic atrophy can sometimes show cupping, but this will be a little later in the disease. Especially autosomal dominant optic atrophy, the disease progression is very, very slow and they can have temporal disc excavation. Any of these would cause cupping, some in an acute phase, some in a late phase, like methanol toxicity, because again, it is a severe disease. You may find cupping as early as in the first, second or third month. Optic disc characteristic, and this is something which you've learned for the last uh, last three months or so, so I'm going to uh, skip it, but you need to know how glaucometers cupping look like. So that was about appearance of optic nerve, cupping, and the allied features, which will give you a clue that you're not dealing with uh, glaucoma. Now let's look at one more patient. 50-year-old male with gradual loss of vision. Vision is not too bad, 6 9 in both the eyes. He has been given a, label, a diagnosis of NTG, uh, and as we said, we look we look at the optic disc, and this is how the optic discs look like. They're, they're, they have a large cup. The neurotrunk rib looks all right, which we have been harping on in the last uh, 15 minutes. So obviously, as Dr. Sony said, we would have done visual fields, and this is these are the visual fields. What's your opinion here, Dr. Sony? Somebody who has been given a diagnosis of normal tension glaucoma, and as you very rightly said, uh, that you would like to uh, request for visual fields, I have given you the visual fields. Sir, the visual field loss is respecting the vertical meridians. In glaucoma patients, we will see loss respecting the horizontal meridians. Fantastic. That's number one. Uh, that it is respecting a vertical meridian. More important, even more important than the vertical meridian uh, being respected. Anything else? Which side? is the predominant impressive visual field effects. Is it superior, temporal, inferior, or nasal? This and this. Temporal. Is it temporal or nasal? There's a clue here. Oh, nasal. No, this is temporal because you see there's a blind spot here. Right, blind spot is because of the presence of optic disc. Optic disc is nasal in fundus, so the visual field, the visual field is temporal. And so you find very good, excellent pickup, Dr. Sony, that the patient's visual field is respecting vertical midline and it is predominantly temporal, which, which is not really a, a feature of glaucoma. 
So a temporal visual field effect, respecting a vertical midline, you know that you are not dealing with glaucoma. A temporal, predominantly temporal visual field effect can be seen in somebody who has a chiasmic compression. I would have requested the MRI straight away. And you find that the patient has an optic nerve kind of defect in the other eye. So this probably can be a junctional scotoma. So what you actually saw there is one, there was a visual field effect, which was respecting a vertical midline, a predominant temporal visual field effect, and it was not matching with uh, what you saw on the optic disc. So if even if the visual field were, were like glaucoma, that there were visual field effect of mainly superiorly, but no uh, defect inferiorly, and you say, oh, maybe this is how glaucomatous visual field effect look like, but if the patient had a superior notching, then you would have expected an inferior visual field defect and not the superior visual field defect. That means that visual field defect was not corresponding to the optic disc. That also will tell you that this probably requires a chasing. It can be something else and not glaucoma. And as we directly said, uh, vertical midline, uh, if the visual field defect respects vertical midline of its predominant temporal, it is surely an indication for neuroimaging. Few more uh, examples of visual field effect, which will alert you of it being uh, a non glaucomatous What do you see here? Can you tell me the complete description of the visual fields here? <laughs> Not so Sorry? Uh, excellent, excellent. Now, homonymous seminopia, uh, which side? See, here there is a blind spot. Mm. So, which side? right or left? Left side. So this is a left homonymous seminopia. And so if you had done uh, neuroimaging with side of the visual pathway, you'll find the lesion right side. Right side. Right. right. And if, if you say that it's a fairly congruous defect, then the older thinking was that more congruous the defect, more posterior is the vision field. Uh, more posterior is actually the lesion. So the older uh, teaching told us that the more congruous the defect, this is more likely to be an occipital lobe lesion is what uh, it was believed. Of course, there have been a dispute on, on, on this theory, but uh, for example, as you would say that more congruous the defect, more posterior the lesion in the vision pathway. So good, good Rolika. And what about this? Sorry, the visual fields have not been represented well. Ideally, this visual field should be here and this should be here. But do you see something here? Especially PhD, if you find. So basically, this is a right superior quadrant myopia. Again, the defect here, this may, this may be a glaucomatous defect. This can be a nasal step. But here you can see very clearly that it is predominantly temporal visual field defect. So this is superior quadrant myopia. Where would you find the lesion in this if you did uh, neuroimaging? Posterior to the optic tract. Yes, and any particular uh, area? Right. If you, if I tell you that this is pie in the sky, temporal, yeah. sir. temporal. Yes, pie in the sky, temporal lobe, pie in the floor, parietal. Right. 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 So, so. What do you think is happening here? Sorry. So this is a secocentral scotoma where there's a central visual field effect which is going right up to the, uh, the blind spot. <coughs> bearing of the blind. I'm sorry? Bearing of the blind spot. Enlarged blind spot. So non glaucomatous optic disc cupping, compressed lesion. These are the compressed lesion which can cause uh, non glaucomatous optic disc cupping. Uh, so, as we said very clearly, glaucomatous versus non glaucomatous cupping. Apart from demographic characteristic like age and visual activity, optic disc characteristics and visual findings and correlation of visual field with the optic disc is what you need to look at to differentiate between uh, glaucomatous and non glaucomatous. Visual, uh, visual field findings, what are you looking at? Glaucoma, as we said, would have a nerve fiber layer or arcuate defects bordering horizontal midline. You can have arcuate scotoma on nasal step versus a compressed lesion or any other uh, non-glaucometrous uh, 
optic neuropathy, you'll have a central scotoma, temporal hemianopia, and we saw the, the example of it. In congruous hemianopia, we saw the example of that as well. So now the question is, if, if there's so much of overlap, if the optic neuropathies can present as cupping, if uh, visual fields can be misleading in few patients, if you don't have a clear answer, why don't we just go ahead and do neuroimaging in everybody who we find or who has a normal tension glaucoma or where you're not very sure whether the patient has glaucoma. And actually, people uh, went ahead and did the study saying, can we just advise neuroimaging everybody because you don't want to miss out on compressive lesions. And they said that cost to benefit ratio performance such studies much more relevant in the, the medical systems where the insurance plays a role or where um, the government uh, uh, supplies the uh, healthcare services uh, that uh, you need to look at the cost to benefit ratio as well. And there are people who did the study saying, can we not, at least for NTG, can we not just do, because NTG you say that pressure is one of the risk factors for you to develop uh, optic neuropathy glaucoma and the pressures have always been normal. Are we not looking at something else? So Stevar and Reed reported that two of the 53 patients, 3.8 percent patients who were referred to them for evaluation of NTG actually turned out, turned out to have a compressive lesion. While Greenfield, and this is the third time I'm quoting him, uh, he said that well, none of the patients who we diagnosed with glaucoma had any compressive lesion. So it works both ways. The 3.8% you miss out in NTG and you say, oh, that's a, that's a fairly significant number and somebody who is suffering from it. And then this paper tells you that uh, 29, uh, 29 patients with uh, cupping with unilateral compressive vision, only one had cupping in visual field loss as an isolated manifestation of their optic neuropathy. Otherwise, they had other features which would have guided you to say that, oh, this is not NTG. Uh, this is a very interesting paper uh, by my friends from Shikharatra, Nikhil Chaudhary, Ronnie George. They all uh, went ahead and looked at, they looked at the case files of their six patients who were being treated elsewhere as patients with glaucoma. And then they turned out to be so, uh, patients with compressive lesion. So they, they went back and said that, okay, why the compressive lesion were missed out in the initial workup that was done elsewhere? And then they said, well, four out of the six patients, uh, the, the treating physicians failed to attain the grossly asymmetrical vision loss. And that's something which we said first, that asymmetrical vision loss, profound vision loss, they are not really a feature of glaucoma, especially early in the disease. Failed to document uh, the pupillary pathology. All six, and that's the reason why it's very important to check pupils in all these patients. If they had checked people carefully, they would have found that uh, all six would have had RAPD, which did not correlate with the optic disc appearance, and you would have said, oh, this, you're not dealing with glaucoma. Failure to document optic disc morphology besides vertical uh, cup disc ratios. They did not look at all six patients probably would have had some feature which would have suggested, like pale and Nara, which would have suggested that you're not dealing with glaucoma, but the, the document did not mention about it. They just mentioned about the vertical compass ratio. The only thing which was mentioned was CD 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, or whatever. Considering unacceptable cupping of the optic this to be synonymous with glaucoma, uh, all six patients. Failure to correlate visual activity with the cupping of the optic disc, all six patients. Half of them actually did not even have the visual fields, and other half who had a visual field, it was misinterpreted, obviously, because they would have had a uh, visual fields which would be dominantly temporal or would have had features which were which were not common with glaucoma. RNFL thinning misinterpretation was there in one patient, failure to obtain neuroimaging despite progressive vision loss. Again, progressive vision loss, a fast progression is not really a, a feature of glaucoma, a follow-up visual field examination in it, adequate in two of them. So who needs, after all this, we say, oh, okay, we looked at everything, we looked at uh, age, we looked at visual equity, we looked at appearance of optic disc, we looked at pupils, we looked at color vision, we looked at visual fields and correlation of visual fields with the optic disc appearance. Now, who would you really consider to be a candidate for neuroimaging if you're not going to do neuroimaging in everybody? Presence of headache or other neurological symptoms, obviously. Symptoms of decreased vision, fluctuating vision or visual field loss, which does not correlate with uh, optic disc appearance, 
atypical visual field uh, for glaucoma like respecting vertical midline, junction scotoma, central or central scotoma. These are sure shot candidates for neuroimaging. Central, central sequel scotoma, junctional scotoma, of decreased vision, presence of neurological symptoms. Atypical rate of progression, uh, monoclear versus bilocular, pallor more than cupping, asymmetrical cupping, especially if progressive changes, diopy remains symmetrical and uncontrolled. So you have patient with glaucoma, IOP is symmetrical, well controlled, but there is asymmetrical progression of cupping. You might be dealing with something else, but not glaucoma. So that concludes my talk. Uh, we have maybe five or five minutes to answer any questions. And I also request Dr. Vanita to share her thoughts. Thank you so much. Yeah, wonderful, Rashman. As usual, you know, it, 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 it is always a dilemma. Uh, as you know, we keep uh, sharing patients <laughs> uh, where uh, very recently I sent you one where um, the uh, visual fields looked uh, neurological rather than glaucomator. So they may be referred as uh, glaucomators. They may turn out to be non-glaucomators. On the other end, they may be uh, referred to you as non-glaucomators and they may turn out to be glaucomators. So all these features are so, so important to, to keep in mind. And you've, you've really highlighted them you know, in a very short, succinct manner. Very well appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's one question I have, sir, that uh, what about the presence of shunt vessels, if at all? Of course, of course. The Pre presence of optical ciliary shunt is uh, a feature of optical which has been compressed in the orbit and is much more, though it can be seen, uh, MCQ for somebody who may be writing any exam, the commonest cause of optical, you might be shown a picture of optical ciliary shunt and say, what is the commonest cause of optical ciliary shunt? It's not really optic pistula, it's CRV. But it can also be seen in optic nerve compression and one of the commonest optic nerve tumor which, will, which is associated and it's a triad actually uh, is meningioma. Mm -hmm. There is a meningioma of the optic nerve sheath. You are more likely to see optic oscillation and you can also see gaze evoked in neurosis. Right. But good, good point. Yes, optic oscillation should guide you towards, uh, towards a non block mm -hmm. Non-block. Thank you so much, sir. And thanks a lot for taking out your precious time for us, especially on a holiday for all of you. And uh, the session was uh, absolutely required because there's always a thin line difference between the cases we see in neuroophthalm and glaucoma. And often the cases are missed. So I hope these pointers will help the postgraduates uh, to make sure that the patients are treated well. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vanita ma'am. Thank you, Rashmin sir. And thanks to everyone for watching. Thank you very much. Happy Dashera to all of you. Happy and Dashera, Shubha <laughs> Thank um, you. And um, next week, as I said, I will not be available, but the following week, hopefully the last week of Glaucoma, I'll be there. Right. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Right. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.